Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome back to our Department of Academics, uh, Medicine Academics. Uh, today we have uh, back again Dr. George on, sir. Uh, we have the uh, sequel of uh, the respiratory failure part two, with along followed by basics of ventilatory support taken by sir. Prior to that, sir will be uh, ans discussing answers to the questions uh, number six to ten on IBG quiz that has been provided before. Hoping that all of you had time to go through it. Uh, if in case or not. Please, uh, as of now, please go along as sir speak uh, and discuss about the uh, questions. Please feel free to ask questions through the time, I mean, lecture time or any time after that. Uh, you can mail your questions to uh, med2 at cmcvelo.ac.in. Also, we'll be providing a link to the feedback for the lecture. Please feel uh, free to uh, give a feedback to the lecture that's been done. This lecture will soon be uploaded on the Department of Medicine YouTube website. Thanks again, sir, for taking this lecture. Now, thank you, sir. Good afternoon, everybody. So we will uh, do like we did yesterday, do the ABG quiz discussion first, followed by the topic. All right, so this is the first, uh, the sixth rather, patient number six with uh, non-invasive ventilation, obese patient. If you look at it, the patient's uh, pH is alkalotic. CO2 is apparently normal. Base excess is positive. So obviously this is a patient with a chronic uh, COPD who's uh, on non-invasive ventilation. And his oxygenation is good on 50%. But his PF ratio is low. So obviously just uh, looking back, he may have been hypoxic. So put on non-invasive ventilation and the gas done after that shows almost normal values. But the uh, person still has type 2 respiratory failure because uh, he's on NIV and we don't know what the first gas has showed. This is a gas on non-invasive ventilation. So how do we interpret this? So they have a patient here who is PO2 is normal with low PF ratio. So he basically has at least type 1 respiratory failure. He probably has had type 2 before he was on NIV because his base excess is high. That is probably a response to chronic CO2 retention, which has now come to the normal range because of the non-invasive ventilation. We, if we had an ABG, which was pre-non-invasive ventilation, we could have had a better insight into what the problem was. So the diagnosis will be normoxima at the moment, but of course he's got poor PF ratio. He's probably got a chronic respiratory acidosis with NIV induced hyperventilation, which is flipped it over to a respiratory alkalosis and a metabolic alkalosis. So we are assuming that he probably had a. One second. Hello, I am on the Zoom meeting. I got back. Any problem? Okay, sorry, that was my daughter. Okay. So this, uh, so the NIV has actually pushed the person to uh, hyperventilation and that has reduced the uh, carbon dioxide, which is pushed the pH further up with a base excess. With the base excess. So what you have is a person who has got an induced hyperventilation due to uh, NIV settings may have been a bit too much and uh, metabolic alkalosis to a pre-existing chronic respiratory acidosis. Go to the next patient, young man with persisting vomiting for a day. So again, he's an alkalotic patient hypokalemia, base excess is high, and respiratory alkalosis, metabolic alkalosis. Now, before you ask me any questions, I want you to see the next slide. Both the values are the same. I've just changed the clinical scenario. This is just to make you think because just by giving the numbers without the clinical scenario, 
Your broad diagnosis were the same, respiratory alkalosis, metabolic alkalosis. But your treatment is different in the two situations. In the first patient, we would reduce the NIV support, let the PCO to build up to a level which you reduce pH to is apparently normal range, otherwise the person is not going to breathe. And reduce the oxygen to allow the PO2 to be between 55 to 60 because he's got a chronic respiratory failure. So that person would breathe. Both of this would stimulate the respiratory center. You would also correct the potassium to reverse any respiratory muscle weakness. For patient seven, because the scenario is vomiting, we don't have a chloride in that. So we can't go further to analyze the SIT. It's an old AVG machine. You may have to give saline because the alkalosis would have been due to a SID-related alkalosis. So at this point in time, I want to stop and ask you, are there any questions? Sir? So you have this same set of numbers with two different scenarios. Since we are on the second leg of our ABG analysis, I wanted you to think. If there are no questions, we go to eight, nine, and 10, because these are absolutely the same numbers with two different foundations. Uh, there's no question as of now, sir. Okay. Can we proceed? proceed. Yeah. All right, then we go to patient date, pregnant lady with vomiting and tachypnea. We have a person who is alkalotic, CO2 is low. So obviously he's got uh, respiratory alkalosis, expected in pregnancy, but she's also got vomiting. Lactate is slightly higher. Base excess is negative. Chloride is 95, sodium is 121. So SID is 20. low. And therefore you've got a metabolic acid acidosis with two causes and a respiratory alkalosis. Again, another patient with vomiting after resuscitation. The oxygens are okay, but if you look at the metabolic parameters, the SID is low and the lactate is increased. And the person has also got a respiratory acidosis because the PCO2 is higher than what you would expect for a pH of 7.30. The rule of thumb, it should be 25 to 35 is higher. So that would be your diagnosis. The last patient, here we have a patient who has come with fever and hypotension. The oxygen parameters are acceptable. Again, double metabolic acidosis. Lactate is high, SID is low. And also again, the respiratory component, CO2 is higher than you would expect for such a low pH maybe going into respiratory failure. But look at the venous and the arterial sample CO2. The difference is high, so it's probably got a low cardiac output. Maybe early sepsis, which is to explain the lactate and maybe going into respiratory failure because the CO2 is higher than what you would expect. So those are the five for this this uh, session. If there are any questions, queries, I'd be happy to answer them either at the end of this or even in the next session. And by the way, there is no session next week because uh, it's Easter and Good Friday. So that will be two weeks from now when we will be starting our session on shock. Okay, we go on to part two, respiratory failure. Respiratory support. The idea of respiratory support is to ensure oxygenation. Adequate for vital organ function, and but also in chronic hypoxic patients to allow continued breathing. If you give too much oxygen, that itself has problems with the person's hypoxic drive being removed. The second aim would be to remove carbon dioxide to optimize the pH. Before we go on to the actual nitty gritty, we will like to explore a few concepts on mixing oxygen and air, flow versus concentration, which I already talked about a bit. A new concept about peak inspiratory flow rate and positive end expiratory pressure. 
Now, if you mix air and oxygen, the final concentration of oxygen is not a straightforward calculation because the air you mix also has 20% oxygen. You can use a mathematical formulation or you can use this known as a magic box. You think of the oxygen required, it's in the middle of the box in terms of percentage. And 100 minus that would give you the parts of air and that minus 20 would give you the parts of oxygen. So for example, if you want 40% oxygen, you would have to mix 100 minus 40 is 60, 40 minus 20 is 20. You have to mix air and oxygen in the ratio of three is to one. So if you have a way to air supply to oxygen supply, your liters per minute must be in a ratio of three to one for you to get 40% oxygen. Second one about flow versus concentration. I've already touched on this before that oxygen dosage is in terms of flow, but that doesn't directly translate to a con concentration. You need to know the peak flow rate for that. For an average peak flow rate, as I had mentioned before, for every liter per minute of oxygen, you can add a fraction 0.25 or a percentage 2.5%. So if you are on, two, on a flow of five liters per minute, 0.21 plus 0.025 into 5 will give you about 34%. My previous slide that 0.025 is wrong. The point should have been 0.025, it was 0.25. So this is the same thing which I had shown in the ABG slide. At 30 liters per minute peak flow, you increase by about 2.5% for every liter of oxygen additional you give. So what is the significance of this flow versus concentration? Take three patients. All of them have the same tidal volume, but an increasing respiratory rate. The IE ratio, the rate time spent in the inspiration expiration is one is to two. The respiratory cycle changes depending on the respiratory rate of the patient. So the inspiratory time goes from four to two to one as the person starts breathing faster. Now, this has a consequence because the oxygen flow from the device is two liters per minute, which is at approximately 33 ml per second. So if you spend a shorter time in inspiration, less oxygen, less pure oxygen can come into the person. And the rest of the flow has to be taken from air. So as you can see, the FiO2 starts dropping. As you start breathing faster, if your oxygen flow is held constant, because the inspiratory time is getting shortened. Now let us look at that, what is the concept of peak inspiratory flow rate. So if a person is in a closed system, he can't breathe anything from outside and his respiratory rate is 10 per minute, his tidal volume is 500 ml and the IE ratio is one is to two, what should be the peak flow rate? Now, what does this mean? Let's have a look. A little bit of uh, cal calculated in depth. Respiratory rate is 10, tidal volume is 500, minute ventilation is five. But if you just give five liters per minute, the person will be very uncomfortable. Let us see why. With a breath rate of 10 per minute, his respiratory cycle time is six seconds. His IE ratio is one is to two. So the inspiratory time is two seconds, expiratory time is four seconds. So the tidal volume taken during inspiration is 500 ml. But this 500 ml is not taken during the entire respiratory cycle. It is taken during the inspiratory time of two seconds. So if you want to inspire 500 ml of air in two seconds, in 60 seconds, the flow should have been 15,000 ml. So 15 liters per minute. That is three times the minute ventilation. If you provide a flow of 15 liters per minute, only then can the person comfortably inhale 500 ml in two seconds. That's the key concept of peak inspiratory flow rate. So your flow rate has to be much higher than your minute ventilation for the person to get the tidal volume in a short inspiratory time. On an average, it's about four to three times the minute ventilation, but that depends on many factors. If you do not give the peak flow rate, if you do not meet the peak flow rate demand, you can have one of two things. In a closed system, the patient starts getting flow starvation. 
he starts gasping and struggling and is uncomfortable, feels claustrophobic. In a person who has got an open system where he can mix in atmospheric air, he pulls in additional air and there's a drop in dilution of FiO2 because it dilutes the oxygen you are administering. And as I said, it is not the same as minute ventilation. <clears throat> now, positive and expiratory pressure. Normally, when you breathe out, the exhalation is to the atmospheric pressure. That is considered as zero for the respiratory physiology. The functional residual capacity is the air remaining in the lungs. And as we said yesterday, it provides the important function of keeping the alveoli open as well as oxygenating blood during the exhalation phase. If a FRC is reduced, you start getting VQ mismatch. Some alveoli may collapse, oxygenation may not be optimized. <laughs> but the FRC can be increased by using PEEP. Excuse me. <laughs> Prevents the, the lungs from collapsing as much as it would if it were exposed to atmospheric pressure. It improves oxygenation, <clears throat> improves lung compliance, and reduces the work of breathing. So this is what happens. If you look at the pressure volume curve, as the pressure rises, volume rises, but not at the same rate. <coughs> if yes, anybody would have blown a balloon, it's very difficult to open it up initially. Then it starts opening up fast. Then it, when it distance fully, it opens up slower again. So the idea of PEEP is to keep the alveoli partially open so it's easier to inflate. That is a safe zone. So in that zone, the compliance is better. So PEEP improves compliance, keeps alveoli open, improves VQ, and reduces the work of breathing. Okay, given those four concepts, let us see how we can improve oxygenation. One is the body position. Placing the head end of the body up decreases microaspiration and improves the mechanical advantage for the diaphragm to Pull, push down on the abdomen and thereby, thereby increase the ventilation. If a person is lying down, the diaphragm has to push all the abdominal contents horizontally. If he sits up, it is partially vertically, so it's easier for a weak diaphragm. Prone positioning improves VQ. This could be awake, prone, which has come into vogue during the COVID era or in mechanically ventilated patients. Humidified gases are dry gases. I'm mean, sorry, all medical gases are dry gases, so it needs humidification. Lack of humidification thickens secretions, blocks airways, crisis, causes VQ abnormalities. <clears throat> so humidification is essential. Physiotherapy to the chest, to the limbs, breathing exercises and early mobilization are also essential components of your respiratory support. Just a word about body position. If you just raise the head and up, many sick patients slide down the bed. Much better to put them in a reverse temporal position where even if they slide down, the chest is above the abdomen. And this provides a better FRC increase than just the head up position. Humidity is the amount of water as vapor in a gas. Absolute humidity is the actual mass of water <clears throat> in a volume of gas and relative humidity is the ratio of what it actually is to the water needed to saturate it. Now, these are the values an alveolar gas and exhale gas. The absolute humidity is 44, drops down to 30 when temperature drops. So, the difference precipitates out. This can be used to rehumidify inhaled gas as a heat and moisture exchanger. So humidification increases comfort for the patient. Heated humidifiers are more efficient, but if there is no heating tube in the tract, in the pneumatic circuit, it can condense. HMEs are commonly used nowadays because the expired condensed water is used to 
rehumidify inspired gas. Let's go on to oxygen first. <coughs> Specific treatments. Oxygen is essential for metabolism. Hypoxic cerebral injury is irreversible. High oxygen is toxic if used for prolonged periods. And used as a medication, remember its terms of concentration and flow. Actually, oxygen costs is cost, cost quite high. So we should try to conserve it as much as possible. We don't really realize it because it's invisible. Sources of oxygen can be air, cylinder, concentration, or liquid oxygen. Cylinders come in various sizes. <coughs> so the codes are as given. And uh, remember that if you have a cylinder, you want to know how much oxygen is left. You have a regulator on top of that. Look at the pressure actually available, divided by the total pressure, and multiplied by the full volume which the cylinder would have contained. That will give you the fresh volume in the cylinder. But you cannot use up the whole volume because that would not leave any pressure left for it to flow. So that is why you use a factor of 135 if you're using kilogram force or 500 as PSI because that is the baseline volume which needs to be left to generate pressure for the oxygen to flow out of the cylinder. And if you know the flow which you are going to use, and you will know the amount of oxygen can be safely left in the cylinder, you will know how long the cylinder will last. The concentrator is a device which removes nitrogen from the air by molecular sieving, needs electricity and maintenance. Liquid oxygen is commonly used in large institutions because it's very convenient, transportable, very cold, minus 183, it expands 860 times. There's a constant loss of uh, about half a liter per day. It's not much for big users, very cost effective for bulk use. So those are the sources. Let's go on to the delivery. We can use nasal prongs, can use masks, can use high flow nasal oxygen or tight masks for CPAP and BiPAP and mechanical ventilation. Now, these first two devices are low flow variable performance because they are not tight fitting and they actually can allow the patient to breathe atmospheric air. And as I said, depending on his peak flow rate, he can dilute the oxygen we give. But nasal cannula about three liters is not comfortable. And face masks, usually four to six liters per minute, less than that will not wash out the expired carbon dioxide, which will collect in the mask. Fixed performance devices, Venturi and oxygen blenders, which are used in ventilators as well as HFNO circuits. That's a flow meter. Usually has some water in the bubble which, through which oxygen bubbles through. I'm not quite uh, recommending its use with water because it is a very inefficient humidifier, but it's very efficient as a, as a culture medium for bugs to cause infection. So I usually don't fill that bubble with water just use it for the flow rate. <clears throat> Nasal prongs, various variable concentration. Masks can be used with Venturi devices as well as with, with a bag so that you have a larger concentration of oxygen. And the Venturi devices can be fitted onto masks or to T pieces onto tracheostomy tubes. And you must look at the device. There is no international color code. So you must look at the device imprinted number for the concentration and the liters of flow which should be given. You have the ammo bag which can be used as a ventilatory device, connect oxygen directly or through a reservoir bag. You can also have a peep valve to administer a peep, self-inflating. So after you push, press it, it will inflate by itself. Unlike a main circuit which does not self-inflate, needs a flow of gas. So if you're going to use a bane circuit for transporting a patient, make sure you have an ambu bag with you because if the supply runs out, the bane circuit will not self-inflate. With an ambu bag, at least you can ventilate the patient with atmospheric air. This is a re fairly recent device, high flow nasal oxygen. High flow to 80 liters per minute is given through a blender and is a step between the mask and a tight fitting mask with a BiPAP or CPAP. So this is a CPAP, BiPAP devices. 
used for respiratory failure. And then you have the ventilator. And you have the extra corporeal membrane oxygenation machine where you have to invasively put lines in the artery or the veins. And depending on the type of oxygenation, carbon dioxide removal you need and the cardiac function, you have venovenous ECMO or arteriovenous ECMOs. I'm not dealing with this in detail. Now, indications for oxygen therapy for resuscitation in shock, <coughs> acute respiratory failure, carbon monoxide poisoning, acute myocardial ischemia, altered mental status, long term for COPD and central sleep apneas. Now, which device will you use? For mild hypoxemia, you can use nasal cannula or face masks. Moderate, start using venturi devices, HFNO. And severe, you have to use CPAP or mechanical ventilation. But if you have got hypercarbia with it, then you have to be a little more careful. You use very titrated oxygen because too much oxygen can take off the respiratory drive. Or you use non-invasive ventilation or invasive ventilation. Now, I just touch on this because uh, more of this will come in these sections on shock. The oxygen requirement is 250 ml per minute with a basal rate. The delivery depends on three variables and one constant. The constant is the amount of oxygen each gram of hemoglobin can take, which is 1.34. So the delivery is 1000 ml per minute. Consumption is only 250. <clears throat> so there's a buffer for, for about three minutes. Problems with too much oxygen, it can cause acute lung injury. A phenomenon known as denitrogenation absorption atelectasis can remove the hypoxic drive and in neonates, a couple of additional complications. <clears throat> now, the DNA basically means that if you give pure oxygen and if your airway is obstructed due to mucus secretions or your tube slipping the wrong way, all the oxygen in the alveoli gets absorbed and the alveolus collapses. So, you get VQ mismatching. The rest of the terms are easy to understand and the toxicity depends on the FIO2 use, the duration of high concentration and the barometric pressure. For deep sea diving, because it's under high pressures, you can only use 2% oxygen. Whereas for space travel, not in the capsule, but outside in space walks, you can use higher concentrations of oxygen because they use it at pressures of one third the atmospheric pressure. <clears throat> this is a phenomenon of denitrogenation absorption at like this. So the tube is slipped down the right bronchus. Person was in 100% oxygen, and the left side lung is collapsed because all the oxygen is got absorbed. So you have to pull up the tube and reinflate the lungs if you want adequate ventilation. Otherwise, even with high oxygen, you would find the person desaturating because all low BQ areas on the left side. What is safe? Less than 50% for prolonged periods. 50 to 60 for 48 hours, more than 60 for 24 hours. But maintaining cerebral oxygenation is more important than preventing pulmonary oxygen toxicity because the first is reversible, the second is reversible to some extent. Use 100% oxygen for all acute resuscitations. Short term, you can use 100%. Long term, accept a slightly lower saturation. A bit about oxygen therapy and air travel, commercial aircraft are pressurized to 8,000 feet. It's roughly equivalent to 8-15%. So for most normal people, there is no problem. But if you've got a COPD patient, you need to be careful. If it's saturating more than 95% on air, no need for any supplemental oxygen. If it is 92 to 95 on air, no need for supplemental. But if he's got risk factors, risk factors being low FPP1, respiratory muscle weakness, lung cancer, or six weeks of surgery, you need to administer a hypoxic challenge. That's basically breathe 15% oxygen, which is what the person would be getting on the plane. And if the SpO2 is reasonable, no oxygen needed. If it is drops, he needs to have additional oxygen during the flight. Okay, we go on to ventilation. Ventilation is the process by which fresh gas is moved into the lungs by creating a pressure gradient. It could be negative pressure by around the thorax or positive pressure to the airway. Nobody uses negative pressure now, it's cumbersome. Positive pressure is what is used. It can be invasive or non-invasive. 
Now, the paradox of a sick patient is that when the heart and lungs fail, they are asked to work harder for the rest of the body. But instead of resting. But conventional positive pressure ventilation is unphysiological. It is not good for the lungs. But in the rest of the body is good because it oxygenates the rest of the body. And the term lung protective ventilation is an attempt to protect the lungs while ensuring its function during positive pressure ventilation. As mentioned last lecture, type 1 is decreased oxygen, type 2 is decreased oxygen and increased carbon dioxide. And you may ventilate the patient to regulate the CO2 in patients with cerebral edema or who are hemodynamically unstable. Person going into impending respiratory muscles, fatigue as seen by respiratory alternance, paradoxical breathing, rising CO2, you may have to ventilate the patient. And the goals are maintaining oxygenation, appropriate pH pCO2, not always normalize, avoid complications. This is a bird's eye view of the oxygenation settings. FiO2, PEEP, ensure adequate perfusion and the body position. And if I'll give a short introduction to mechanical ventilation. I'm not going into detail. Basically, there's a system to initiate the inflation, hold it in inflation, cycle to exhalation, and the exhalation phase. Now, in a person, you can have volume, pressure, flow, or time. But these are not simultaneously adjustable. If flow and inspiratory time are set, volume is, cannot be further adjusted. If volume is set, pressure is not fully controllable because it depends on the airway resistance and lung compliance. So though there are four variables, you can only control part of them. The rest of them you have to monitor to make sure it's safe. <clears throat> so that's a bird's eye view of ventilatory parameters. Minute ventilation depends on tidal volume you set and the rate. The rate depends on your inspiratory time and the expiratory time, that is the IE ratio. And the tidal volume depends on your inspiratory flow and your inspiratory time. That decides the mode you of ventilation. Mode means the pattern of interaction between patient and machine. And basically, you have two modes, volume and pressure. And then you have various sub-modes among that, depending on who controls the power and the rate. For instance, spontaneous breathing, the patient controls the power, and that is the ability to take a certain tidal volume, which is what I mean by power. Rate is the number of breaths per minute. Both are controlled by the patient, you call it spontaneous. If it's both by the machine, you call it controlled ventilation. You can have various combinations of this. I'm not going into the detail. That can be done in another lecture if you're interested, but it's mainly for critical care personnel. Non-invasive ventilation, you can use tight-fitting mask. And basically, CPAP is spontaneous ventilation with PEEP. By level positive airway pressure, you add an additional support during the inspiratory phase, not just during expiration, to get rid of the carbon dioxide. And lung protective ventilation is, as I said, meant to reduce the deleterious effects of positive pressure ventilation. What are the components? Reduce the FiO2 to 0.5 as soon as possible, compatible with brain protection. Prevent VAP. Use safe tidal volume, 6 to 8 ml per kilo. Ensure that plateau pressure and driving pressure are safe. What is the plateau pressure? When the ventilator first pushes in air, there's a peak. As the gas redistributes to the alveoli, there is a drop to a plateau pressure. And during exhalation, it drops further down to the baseline pressure, which may be atmospheric or if peep, slightly above atmospheric. And what is the driving pressure? The driving pressure is the difference between your plateau pressure and the peep. And in the recent studies have shown that shows and has an important a component of inducing ventilator-induced lung and injury. If it is very high, about 24, you are more likely to get ventilator-induced lung damage. Any questions? Thank you, sir. Welcome. I will send this set of slides to you soon and you can distribute them because this has got some additional information not in the previous slides which were sent. Awesome. Any questions? Uh, we have the link uh, for the feedback form mentioned in the chat box. Also, um, any questions, please feel free through the next two weeks to press. There's a request for last but before slide, please. Sir. Last but before. This one. 
is it this one you can also unmute yourself and speak out or next slide sir the message next slide this one yes okay so basically it says that if your peep is low and you achieving the same plateau pressure if your peep is 5 plateau pressure is 30 the difference is 25 the peep is 10 and you have the same plateau pressure the excursion of the alveoli is between 10 and 25 the peep is low it is between 5 and 25 this large excursion of alveoli during ventilation is supposed to break the elastic fibers in the alveolar wall and cause ventilator induced lung damage so the idea is to keep the peep higher and the plateau pressure less than 30. To ensure that uh, no damage is done to the lungs during ventilation. That's a lung protective strategy. We'll have the slides sent to you. You can always ask questions next time also if you have doubts. Thank you, sir. Uh, any further questions? Please mail to metro at cmcvalor.ac.in for the slides. We'll be uploading this lecture soon on Department of Medicine YouTube website. Uh, Anything on the blood gases? Hello? APGs, any questions? Uh, not yet, not yet, sir. Okay. I've sort of expanded the explanations because uh, it might make things clearer. So when we are delivering oxygen uh, via face mask or nasal prongs, so do we uh, encourage water in the chamber while delivering the oxygen? If your upper airway is intact, you don't really have to humidify because your nose is a pretty good humidifier. The person may feel dry hours if the flows are very high. Otherwise, there is no real. Mainly if the upper airway is bypassed, like an endotracheal intubation and tracheostomy, you really have to ensure good humidification. So personally, the flow meter bubble chamber under that flow meter doesn't serve much purpose because a very ineffective humidifier is a good culture medium and sometimes it is the cause of a lot of infection. So I don't think you need to use that bubble chamber, but if you use it, well, whatever the practice is in your hospital is fine. But just remember that uh, it needs to be changed frequently. We leave it on for a couple of weeks. It's not going to be a good uh, humidifier humidifi solution. It will be more like a culture medium for infection. Sure, sir. Also, sir, the oxygen concentration by venturi, which we, uh, we, which we, which is mentioned, which doesn't go, I mean, uh, doesn't apply when you're using a bipap, sir. When we have a, does it bipap you, and venturi are two different things. Yeah, I mean, uh, when you're calculating a fear ratio, it doesn't extrapolate to the same amount of oxygen delivered if you're using a bipap with a. No. Because bipap is uh, positive pressure, you don't know what unless you know the flow rate. You cannot can calculate the concentration it's because BiPAP has no blender with it. A ventilator has a blender. You can titrate the oxygen accurately, but a BiPAP you just mix the flow with the incoming gas, which is pushed by the machine. So in so fact, if you increase the pressure, you will find the oxygen concentration sometimes dro the saturation dropping because you're pushing more air. Mm. Yes. So that is a commonly observed phenomenon. So there's no way. You basically have to increase the oxygen and the uh, support you give and titrate it to the SPO2. 
Sure. There is and no then we can calculate an actual percentage. You cannot do it on a bypass machine. So calculating peer pressure in such a setting is not. It's not. It is not possible on a bypass machine. The, what I said to that percentage was for a person who's breathing spontaneously. On a bypass machine, you can't uh, calculate it like that because you really don't know how much air is being pushed by the machine to attain that pressure. Yes, sir. That's a good point. You can't use that calculation. Correct. Any further questions? I think if that's all for today, means that we'll wind up, sir. Thanks, sir. Uh, Thank so you. Uh, yeah. So, what about NIV in a hemodynamically unstable patient? Hemodynamically unstable patients should not be getting NIV, in my opinion. You need to have it under control. Because NIV, the patient, if you actually look at the facts, in a person who is in shock, he has to deliver oxygen to a lot of uh, tissues. But the BP is low. The respiratory muscles consume a lot of energy. And if a person needs NIV, the respiratory muscles will be consuming about 25% of the oxygen delivery to the whole body. The idea of uh, supporting a patient in shock is to take off the body's oxygen consumption to the organs like respiratory muscles by putting him on a, on a ventilator, thereby the electrical energy does the work and allow the low blood pressure to deliver oxygen to vital tissues. So if a person who's hemodynamically un unstable is on NIV, it is a bit of a tricky situation because uh, he's not able, he will not be able to carry on for very long. A person in shock should uh, ideally be intubated and on controlled ventilation so that one component of oxygen consumption is removed. The respiratory muscles are then free not to consume oxygen. If he continues to breathe, and that to a dyspneic patient, the respiratory muscles need a lot of oxygen and they'll start fatiguing and the heart cannot keep up pumping up uh, the amount of oxygen delivery to the respiratory muscles as well as to other vital organs. And finally, the patient may crash. So that is what is likely to happen if a person is severely hemodynamically compromised. But if it's just a transient, then, then it might, you might get away with it. But generally, a person in shock should be intubated. We'll deal with that in detail in the next couple of sessions, two weeks from now on shock. Oh, thank you, sir. Any further questions? And it's going to be more interesting in the next session of series. I think on a day-to-day -day management, we'll have uh, questions on, um, will be a session on a circulatory failure and shock per se. Don, Don has raised his hand. Uh, Don, do you have any questions? I didn't get that question. No, I, I'm also waiting. Uh, sir, there's a question now. Uh -huh. Can you please explain what silent hypoxia is in COVID? Oh, <laughs> well. That is a phenomenon observed in COVID because for some strange reason, I myself do not understand, many hypoxia usually causes a certain amount of respiratory distress and dys, dyspnea. But in patients with early COVID, it was seen that these patients are, uh, what should I say? Okay. Unreasonably happy. Mm -hmm. For some strange reason, I'm not sure what the exact physiological reason is, but they seem to go around not feeling the hypoxia at all. I don't know whether it's part of an early encephalopathy due to the COVID. Till they actually crash. So the saturation may be lower to levels which normally would cause dyspnea and uh, distress in uh, people who don't have COVID. And that is known as a silent hypoxia. Some people call them happy hypoxics in COVID. The cause of the phenomenon, we don't know. Maybe it's part of an early encephalopathy. But if the phenomenon exists, there is no doubt. Uh, so, then further to that, uh, asking what type of ventilation might benefit such a scenario? No, if a person is only hypoxic, you don't have to ventilate. Remember, ventilation is to remove carbon dioxide. For hypoxic patients, you just administer oxygen. The aim of administration of oxygen is to improve oxygenation. Now, if you find that the person is happy on oxygen, his saturation is good, you go ahead and give only oxygen, nasal prongs or face masks or whatever device you have. 
Ventilation comes into the picture when you find the patient is fatiguing, hemodynamically unstable, or retaining carbon dioxide. Then you have to think of ventilation to remove the extra carbon dioxide from the body and reduce the work of breathing. But if it's just for oxygenation, you can actually use starting with nasal prongs, go on to face mask, go on to HFNO, or even go to CPAP. That is just spontaneous with uh, PEEP and oxygen. Once you start retaining carbon dioxide, then you have to go on to BiPAP and then invasive mechanical ventilation onto ECMO also if you miss them. So that is the sequence. Sure, sir. I think uh, Don, that cleared your doubt, I think. Any further questions? I think you'd be able to unmute yourself now if any further questions. Uh, please fill in the feedback to the well, lecture. It's provide, the link is provided here and it's also available from the metro at cmcvalley.ac.in. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you. Thanks everyone for the patient listening and I think uh, a very no happy. I'll send you the slides straight away and please distribute it. Sure, sure, sir. Thank you, sir. I think we'll wind up for today. Thank you.